there are people who will be coming as organisers. There are many who are actually part of this today event. As organisers, for us, we work very hard for many, many months. And as you know, and those people I know that you are in the seats of people who organise events, it just doesn't happen on its own. And months of planning, making sure things happen. And then there is on the day, which is today. And if it happens, then I hope and pray that everything goes well. And it's my, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure. And just to give you a few um, housekeeping things, in the case of an emergency, the exits are that one on the right hand side, two on either side, but out in an orderly manner. And then there will be awards, which I hope you all will come back for because that is a very special moment for us. And then there's, please remember that we take every opportunity to try to raise charity, Madidita's charity, which is the, uh, the Friends of Parkinson UK. And a, and a disease which, God forbid, catches quite a lot of us at different times of our lives. And for us, I know that we ask you to pay, pay a small donation towards it, but I hope you will put your hands and your, in your pockets and raise as much money as you can so that, God forbid, in the future, if we happen, all our loved ones happen to get that disease or whatever you think, then we can be actually looked after. It is always customary that we start. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask Imam Arif to say it aloud so we can start the procession. Thank you. Let's have a look at the geographical place of where Pakistan and India stand. 
And Pakistan, as, as you know, and you've got the flags on the right hand side, is the South Asian part of Asia. And you will see, you will notice from the map, you will see it in Pakistan. I would like to start off with giving you a brief introduction and perhaps lead you to 1947. I hope this is a kind of a story. I did ask you to bring your children. And as you know, as best as I can as a teacher, I understand the different forum that exists. And I will be as clear as I can, but please be aware of the fact that I need to get through from, nine, from where we are today uh, in 1870 to 1947. Hopefully it won't be too long. So between 1870 to 1914, European nations engaged in imperialism, bringing much of the world under the control. Now what does imperialism actually mean? So imperialism is the domination by one country of the political, economic and cultural life of another country or region. So one country basically takes over the whole of that region. By the mid-1800s, Britain's controlled three-fifths of India. So you can imagine, look how big India is. Three-fifths of it was controlled by the British. And so during World War I, over one million Indians served in the British War. Indian nationalists grew increasingly angry about this. They had little freedom of their own home. They lived here, yet the British actually came over and were looking after them. The Indian nationalists grew increasingly angry that they had little freedom at home. The British promised more Indian self-government. You, you look after your area, you look after the government. But after the war, however, when after the war, so however, when World War I came, uh, and the Britain proposed only minor changes. They had said to them, look, come to the war with us, but we will make all the changes. We'll give you your freedom. It didn't happen when you returned. And so there was huge protests. So in 1919, many of you will probably remember this, the massacre of Arista, where peaceful protesters shot by British soldiers, absolutely laid them down, hundreds of them, turning, that was the turning point, convinced many Indians of the need of complete independence. The British do not look after it. So therefore, in the 1920s, Mahatma Gandhi emerged as the new leader, hugely talented person. But the way he dressed was so modest. He came down to earth to sort of say to people, as it were, look, I am part of you, I want peace. And he united all Indians behind the drive to independence, including the Muslims. So Mahatma Gandhi is renowned for his work. So for his role in achieving Indian compared to George Washington. But he's also inspired people around the world. So influenced by Martin Luther King Jr. with his use of non-violence. And as you know, Martin Luther King also said, I don't want to fight you, I, want, I have a point to make, and therefore I will make speeches in my freedom, and I want you to join me. So Gandhi campaigned for non-violence, slowly forced Britain to agree to hand over some powers of the Indians. However, will that happen? The Britain outraged Indian leaders by doing this. They postponed further action on the independence. Hold on a second, we'll do that in a minute. Bringing India into World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, World War I, now World War II, without consulting them. World War II, millions of Indians served in the British war effort. Angry nationalists had enough, launched a campaign of non-cooperation. So World War II ended in independence, could no longer be delayed. And then it happened, didn't it, ladies and gentlemen? With the, with, but how was it going to happen? India is so big. It's easy to have partition. But as independence, and independence neared, tensions between Indians on the two largest religions obviously took place. You had the Hindus and the Muslims. The Indian Muslim minorities wanted a state on their own. Everybody lived in harmony, but there was war going on, civil war. So in 1947, Britain partitioned India. How did it work? Created a Hindu India, created a Muslim Pakistan, and the Pakistan was then divided, because obviously where the Muslims were, were divided in West Pakistan and East Pakistan. And as you know, we only have the West, we don't call it West or East, it is now Bangladesh and we call it Pakistan. But ladies and gentlemen, this was not easy. The partition of India were uprooted millions of people who sought safety on the other side of the new borders. You will see some of these pictures which are quite alarming, stemming from years of mistrust exploited by the British 
horrified Gandhi, who had withdrawn from active politics, intervened and said, hold on a second, we would like some peace in here. Didn't work. The extremists of India didn't like it, and unfortunately, he was killed by the Hindu extremists in 1948 because he was supporting the Indians as the best, uh, Muslims as the best as can. So what did actually happen? So fear and mistrust defined relations between India and Pakistan, and independence borders, conflict ignited a war over Kashmir and a state in the Himalayas. Its Hindu prince signed Kashmir over to India, but its majority Muslim population wanted to be part of Pakistan. So since then, the two nations have fought several years over Kashmir. During the Cold War, when we thought they were fine, during the Cold War, India and Pakistan took different paths. India said, India welcomed economic aid from, from both superpowers, but otherwise embraced neutrality. We're going to get the support from the superpowers, but you know, we will be neutral. Pakistan said, hold on. Pakistan feeling threatened by both India and the USSR, which is Russia at the moment, to the north accepted military aid. Hold on, we will work with our military and we will sustain our own. The danger of conflict rose after India became a nuclear power in 1974. Pakistan feeling threatened developed an unnuclear capability. Hold on a second, you've got a nuclear power, we're going to have a nuclear power. Unfortunately, this doesn't go down very well with the rest of the world. Both nations refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1995. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my slideshow on the 14th of August. But you know what I wanted to show you was a little bit about the images and the short film that you're going to see now will put my slideshow into context. Thank you.